Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone. Most people who learn a foreign language learn it so that they can one day have real life conversations with native speakers. When you start out learning and crack open your first textbook or listen to your first podcast, having a real conversation can feel like a fantasy. When everything about a language feels new, it can be overwhelming. But this couldn't be further from the truth. While it does take a significant amount of time and effort to become fluent, having a conversation might not be as far off as you think. In this video, we'll look at three ways you can boost your conversational skills and start talking to native speakers. Number one, find native speakers and practice with them. It's unlikely you live near a big group of native speakers to practice with. If you happen to be in a major or international city, your chances may be better. Check and see if your city has a general language exchange. Chances are there could be a native speaker there who is also trying to learn another language. Practicing in person with a native speaker is probably the most interesting option for honing your speaking skills. But if you can't find anyone where you live, the next best option is to look online. Luckily for language learners, the past 10 years or so have seen an explosion in online language exchange sites. On these websites, you can search for someone who is a native speaker of your target language and is also learning your native language. The idea behind a language exchange is that you communicate with them via video or text chat, and half of the time, they help you practice your target language, and for the other half, you help them practice theirs. Practicing via an online language exchange is a highly effective way to practice your conversational skills. Number two, work on pronunciation. Pronunciation is often an overlooked skill when it comes to learning a foreign language. Most people think of a good foreign accent as a luxury rather than a necessity. But what most people don't talk about is how having a good accent boosts your listening and comprehension skills. If you can hear a sound from a foreign language and know how to make it yourself, then you're more likely to understand native speakers when they talk at normal speed, and you're also more likely to remember any new words or phrases you come across. Having a good accent means that the language no longer sounds foreign. Instead, it sounds familiar, maybe even natural. So how do you go about perfecting your accent? The best way is to break down the language into its individual sounds. Make note of any sounds that are the same or similar to your native language and of those that are different. Of the sounds that are different, spend your time practicing the ones that you find the hardest to say correctly. After you're comfortable with the individual sounds, you can start linking together words and phrases. This is where accent practice starts to get really fun and interesting. Get your hands on some native speaker audio from a TV show, song, or podcast. Play the audio back and listen closely a few times. Take note of how words blend together in speech. Then, do your best to imitate what you hear, trying to match the speaker's emphasis and intonation. Our language learning program's playback feature is perfect for this. Record yourself and compare it to the original recording. Rinse and repeat until you're comfortable with the audio selection, and then move on to something more difficult. This is how you can break through the accent barrier and really start to make the language your own. Number three, learn phrases, not just individual words. Learning grammar and individual words is great, but it's not the only approach you should take if you want to speak fluently. In addition to your regular grammar and vocabulary, try learning whole phrases, even if you aren't totally sure how they work grammatically. Learn phrases that are specific to your needs. It's a good idea to learn phrases that are grouped around a certain setting or subject, such as simple greetings or introductions, questions for getting to know someone, or traveling comfortably. You can even learn filler phrases, which you can use so that you have something to say when, well, you don't know what to say. Learning phrases like this will help you become conversational faster. You may not understand what you're saying literally, but as long as you know the general meaning behind the phrase and know when to use it, you'll be able to talk like a native. Eventually, your knowledge of grammar and vocabulary should catch up with the phrases you know. Learning a new language should feel like an adventure. There will be plateaus and periods in your learning where it feels like you're hitting a wall, but being able to speak with native speakers and have real conversations will help you combat language fatigue. After all, talking to someone face-to-face -face in a foreign language is one of the main reasons we start learning in the first place. And for even more ways to gain conversation skills, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language.
And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Waiter. The first word is waiter. Waiter or waitress or wait staff. These are the people who bring you your food and take your orders. In a sentence, your waiter will be with you in a moment. Menu. The next word is menu. Menu is the piece of paper or the document, the thing that's on your table or near your table that has a description of all the food you can eat at that restaurant. In a sentence, can I have the menu, please? Order. The next word is order. Order. You can use this as a noun or as a verb. You can say to order something or where is my order? In a sentence, I would like to order two steaks, three hamburgers, four beers, a large pizza, and a piece of chocolate cake to go to my home. Water. The next word is water. In American restaurants, you usually get water for free. I noticed when I traveled in Europe, you had to pay for water at restaurants. That was interesting. In a sentence, American restaurants usually give you a glass of water without having to ask. Dessert. The next word is dessert. Dessert is the sweet stuff, the sweet course, all the sweet foods that come after the main part of the meal. In a sentence, can we see the dessert menu? Chef. Chef. Chef is the leader of the kitchen, the person that is cooking the food. In fancy restaurants, the chef is like the, the one who is running the operation, the manager of everything. There are different levels of chef in the kitchen. In a sentence, you can say, please give my compliments to the chef. Fast food. The next word is fast food. Fast food is anything that's quick. Popular examples in America are McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Jack in the Box. So those are all fast food restaurants. You get in and you get out very, very quickly. They don't have a reputation for being very healthy. Uh, in a sentence, I try to eat fast food as rarely as possible. Bill. The next word is bill. You might also hear check. Bill and check mean the total of your meal. How much uh, your dining experience costs you is the bill or the check. A bill comes before you have paid. A receipt is the piece of paper you get after you have paid. The receipt shows, confirms you have paid money. The bill is the request for money. That's the difference between bill or check and receipt. In a sentence, usually you say, can I have the bill, please? Or can I have the check, please? Delicious. Delicious. Delicious means something that tastes good. We have many variations on delicious. We say delicious, good, yum, yummy, fantastic, great, and so on. It's kind of strange to me to say this is delicious. I usually just say this is good or this is really good. Something like that is a bit more natural than delicious. In a sentence, my dinner today was delicious. Main course main course. It's often like a meat dish, actually, like like roast something or I don't know. It's also called the entree. Maybe it's a really fancy pasta dish in some cases. I don't know. In a sentence, for the main course, our specials are chicken and zucchini and curry. A table for three, please. A table for three, please. You tell them the number of people that you are total so that the host can bring you to an appropriate table. A table for two, please. A table for five, please. Could I please see a menu? Could I please see a menu? Usually menus are given to you as soon as you sit down at your table. But if that's not the case and you need to ask, this is a polite way to do it. Could I please see a menu? I'd like to try this dish. I'd like to try this dish. When looking at a menu, hopefully you'll find something you want to eat. I'd like to try this dish. Could you leave out the onions? Could you leave out the onions? If there's an ingredient in the dish that you're ordering that you don't want, you can always ask the waiter if it could be prepared without that ingredient. So for example, I might say, could I get the burger but with no cheese? Could you pass the salt? Could you pass the salt? When you're at a restaurant, especially if you're at a big table with a lot of people, you might not always be able to reach things. So you would ask, could you pass me the salt? Could you pass me the ketchup? Could you pass me another napkin? Waiter, waiter. A waiter is someone who takes your order and brings you food. In America and in many other Western countries, it's more polite to call a waiter to your table by simply saying, excuse me? Or if you see another waiter walking by, but it's not your waiter, you can always say, 
Excuse me, if you see our waiter, could you please let them know to come to our table? Is there any dairy in this dish? Is there any dairy in this dish? This is something you would say if you have a dairy allergy, a dairy intolerance, or you just don't like dairy. You're asking the waiter about the ingredients in a particular dish. I do this all the time. Is there any cheese in this? No? Okay. And if there is an ingredient that you don't want, for example, onions, you could say, are there any onions in this? And the waiter might say yes. And if you don't want it, you could always request, could you leave out the onions? Could you prepare it without the onions, please? Can we get separate checks? Can we get separate checks? This is actually something that's very common, especially in America. If you might go out with a group of friends, or even if you're on a date, sometimes you might want to get separate checks, pay for your own things. That way, you can all pay separately just for what you yourself ordered, and you won't have to worry about owing each other money or calculating off a big, huge bill. Are there any specials today? Are there any specials today? A special at a restaurant is a dish that isn't usually on the menu. It's something that's special, but it's a special that the chef is offering that day or that week or that month. So sometimes if you don't see what the specials are, you'd ask your waiter, excuse me, are there any specials today? Could we have the bill, please? Could we have the bill, please? This is how you request that the check or the bill comes to your table. Could we get the check, please? Could we get the bill, please? You're asking this to your waiter who will then bring you the check and you can pay. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. The 4th of July is also known as Independence Day. It commemorates the signing of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. Think of it as America's birthday. When most people think about July 4th, they think about fireworks. But do you know why Americans display fireworks on the 4th? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Americans kick up their heels on this holiday in many ways, but people mostly go to picnics and barbecues. It's also a day to be patriotic, so you'll often see the American flag and people dressed in red, white, and blue. Parades are another common sight on the 4th of July, especially during the daytime. Why do they take place during the day? Because as soon as it gets dark, Americans gather to watch magnificent fireworks in the night sky. Some families set off small fireworks in their driveways, and some gather in parks or by the sea to see the larger, more professional firework displays. The most outstanding firework displays take place in New York City and Washington, D.C. Both of these displays are televised nationally, and the president even attends the display in Washington, D.C. On the 4th of July, you'll hear the U.S. National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. The words were written by Francis Scott Key, who was inspired to write the lyrics after witnessing the Battle of Fort McHenry in the War of 1812. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Why do Americans shoot fireworks on the 4th? The custom of shooting off fireworks on Independence Day can be traced back to a quote by our second president, John Adams. He said that he believed that July 4th should be celebrated by pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Are there any holidays when fireworks are shot off in your country? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. Halloween is a time for celebration in the USA. It's become the second most popular holiday in the nation over the years. Halloween is known for its oftentimes scary costumes, elaborate parties and events, horror film festivals, and its many gothic trappings. This holiday was a latecomer to the US, not really becoming popular until the early 20th century. Today, it's one of the most anticipated holidays in the USA. Halloween is very much associated with scary costumes and things that are wonderfully creepy. Do you know what holiday dressing up in scary costumes was likely borrowed from? 
We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. People in the USA typically carve pumpkins into scary jack-o'-lanterns, decorate their houses to look as creepy as possible, and wear elaborate costumes to celebrate this holiday. These aspects of Halloween, according to some, have their roots in various Celtic and European myths, legends, and cultural traditions. Today, popular horror films have also influenced the cultural traditions that surround Halloween. The monster movies of the early 20th century are significant contributors to the look and feel of modern Halloween celebrations in the USA. Trick-or-treating started at the beginning of the 20th century to curb the vandalism and destruction that once characterized this holiday in the USA. Today, Halloween is a night when the streets are full of families getting treats from their neighbors, and vandalism and other problems are rare. Some families and social groups set up elaborate haunted houses and invite people to go through for free or for a donation. Hay rides and other nighttime events are also very popular in rural areas. Check the local theaters and TV stations around Halloween and you'll find plenty of scary stuff to watch, too. Over the years, Halloween costumes in the USA have become more varied. Some people, particularly younger participants, forego the dark, gothic theme of the holiday and dress up as characters from adventure movies, literary figures, or even historical figures. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know what holiday dressing up in scary costumes was likely borrowed from? Samhain is considered to be a significant influence on Halloween celebrations, though this is disputed by some scholars. Samhain was, and still is to some extent, celebrated in Scotland and Ireland. It's associated with the final harvest of the year more than it is with scary ghouls and goblins, though spirits do play a part. The dressing up was originally done to scare malicious spirits away or to trick them into thinking that you were one of them to avoid harm. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is Halloween celebrated in your country? If so, how? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Labor Day is celebrated nationwide in the U.S. on the first Monday in September. It's been celebrated since 1894 at the federal level, and it's the only U.S. federal holiday dedicated to American workers. The holiday arose from a time of political crises in the U.S., and partially in reaction to a particularly bloody strike. Labor Day was adopted as an alternative to International Workers' Day. Do you know why? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Labor Day celebrates the American worker. It's also the unofficial end of the summer vacation and recreation season. In most U.S. school districts, summer vacation ends right after Labor Day. The celebrations are informal, and the main purpose of the holiday is really to give people a day off of work and to recognize what working men and women contribute to the nation. Every Labor Day in the U.S., you'll smell plenty of barbecues firing up and see a lot of people having informal gatherings in parks and in their own backyards. In addition to celebrating laborers, this day means that summer is drawing to a close. In touristy cities, you'll start to see cars driving away and people returning to their homes. Parades are sometimes held to commemorate the day as well. Labor Day is also significant for professional sports as it's the official beginning of the professional football season in the United States. On the Thursday immediately after Labor Day, sports fans tune in to the very first pro football game of the year. For post-secondary students, college or university starts right after the holiday, and college football is in full swing soon after Labor Day as well. Put away your white shoes! Wearing white shoes after Labor Day and before Memorial Day is considered a faux pas by some fashion-conscious Americans. This, however, is now a rather out-of-date custom. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know why Labor Day was adopted as an alternative to International Workers' Day? Labor Day was offered as an alternative to International Workers' Day due to the political nature of the latter. Fearing the political influence of the communist movements just starting up in Europe, Congress and President Grover Cleveland needed to reach out to the American labor force. They rushed Labor Day through as a holiday. It was already celebrated in several states to offer reconciliation with the labor movement and to head off the influence of the more radical workers' movements in Europe. 
How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is there a day similar to Labor Day in your country? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Columbus Day celebrates the day that Christopher Columbus first arrived in the Americas. The holiday is celebrated on October 12th and, in some cities, there are very large parades and many other events. It's particularly popular in U.S. cities with large Italian populations, though it's celebrated nationwide. A famous American charity organization is named after Christopher Columbus and takes part in celebrations during Columbus Day. Can you guess which one? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. In Italian-American communities, particularly in the larger cities in the U.S., Columbus Day is very much tied to a celebration of their heritage, in addition to the celebration of Columbus' arrival in the Americas. Cultural and religious images and symbols specific to Italian-Americans are abundant in Columbus Day parades. If there's one thing that defines Columbus Day celebrations in the U.S., it's the parade. New York City is particularly well known for its large Columbus Day parade. San Francisco has the longest running Columbus Day celebration in the United States, dating back to 1868. Columbus Day in the U.S. is not celebrated in every state. In fact, some U.S. states do not recognize it at all, and many schools remain open on the day. There is controversy surrounding this holiday, and it's been changed to a celebration of Native American cultures in some areas. Columbus didn't realize he'd arrived in the Americas. This is why Native Americans are sometimes referred to as Indians, which, incidentally, some say is politically incorrect. Columbus initially thought he was in the East Indies. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know a famous American charity organization that's named after Christopher Columbus and takes part in celebrations on Columbus Day? The Knights of Columbus is a charitable organization with very strong Italian and Catholic roots. They participate in just about every Columbus Day celebration. You'll find them marching among the participants in any large parade, to be sure. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Are there any holidays that celebrate a famous historical figure in your country? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Thanksgiving is one of the most celebrated holidays in the United States. It also marks the beginning of the holiday season. The weeks leading up to Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and the winter solstice, which are all widely celebrated holidays in the U.S. For retailers, Thanksgiving begins their busiest season. Thanksgiving is celebrated on the fourth Thursday of November. Thanksgiving was founded as a national holiday by one of the most famous presidents of the United States. Do you know who it might have been? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Thanksgiving, to a large extent, is about having a feast with friends and family. Turkey is the traditional main course with yams, squash, pumpkin pie, cranberries, and other rich and filling foods rounding out the meal. Some families spend weeks preparing for their Thanksgiving feast, and to stuff oneself is most certainly encouraged. The Thanksgiving meal of today is rooted in the meal that the pilgrims from Europe shared with the Native Americans on the first Thanksgiving. This was quite a feast. Turkey, duck, goose, squash, corn, and a plethora of other foods were shared between the Europeans and the Native Americans. This original fate was said to go on for three full days. Football is another tradition during Thanksgiving celebrations in the United States. Watching the football game while preparing the Thanksgiving meal is an important part of the celebration for many families. Families that aren't sports fans, however, may opt to spend the time outside, enjoying the crisp autumn air, or may find other diversions to enjoy while the turkey cooks. Thanksgiving is not a uniquely American holiday. There are similar celebrations in Canada, for instance. The concept behind the holiday, showing thankfulness by having a feast, spans many cultures. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know who founded Thanksgiving as a national holiday? 
Abraham Lincoln established Thanksgiving during the dark days of the American Civil War. Even though the holiday was officially born during this conflict, it's more associated with the initially good relations between the first European immigrants and the Native Americans. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is there a day in your country where you give thanks? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hi! How's it going? I'm Alicia. Nice to meet you. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn new, more common ways to ask and answer the question, how are you, in English. You've probably learned, how are you, and I'm fine, in textbooks before, but in the United States, people will usually ask this question and answer it in a different way. First, let's review. If someone says, how are you? You can say, I'm fine. I'm fine. Here are some other ways to answer. Pretty good. This means about the same thing as, I'm fine. Pretty good. We also have, not bad. You can use this if you are feeling just okay or so-so. Not bad. Let's look at our question again. How are you? This is the most well-known way of asking how someone is. You could use it when you want to be polite. But now, let's look at some different ways to ask how someone is. These ways are more casual and much more common. First, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? You can answer this in many ways. If you're feeling good, you can say, good. Good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad. Not bad. Once more, good. Pretty good. Not bad. Here's a tip. Even though these answers mean the same thing as, I'm fine, you can't answer, how's it going, with, I'm fine. It will sound a bit strange. If you're not feeling good, you can say, not so good, not so good, not great, not great, or not so well, not so well. Be careful. If you say one of these, the other person will usually ask, why, what's wrong, to be polite. Then you will have to explain. Another casual but very common version of how are you is what's up, what's up. To reply, use a cheerful voice as you say, not much, not much, or nothing much, nothing much. This means you're free and able to chat. Since what's up is just another way of saying hello, you can also reply with hey or hi. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. A lot of the time when we ask questions that mean how are you in English, we're not actually asking about the other person's health. We're only asking to be polite. You should think of these questions as another way of saying hello, a way for the conversation to get started, instead of actual, literal questions. In fact, when someone asks you, what's up, you don't even have to answer. Just say, what's up, in reply. Hey everyone, Alicia here. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to ask what someone's hobbies are without using the word hobbies. You've probably seen the question, do you have any hobbies? Or what are your hobbies in an English textbook before? However, native English speakers almost never use the word hobbies when asking about them. 
A much more natural way to ask the same question is, what do you do for fun? Let's practice this question. What do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? You can also ask, what do you do in your free time? What do you do in your free time? So how would you answer this question? Let's look at how native speakers would do it. The easiest way is to say, I like to, or just, I like, followed by what you like to do. For example, if you like watching movies, you could say, I like to watch movies, or I like watching movies. I like to watch movies, or I like watching movies. And if you like golf, you could say, I like to play golf, or I like playing golf. I like to play golf, or I like playing golf. You can emphasize how much you like your hobby by adding a word like really in front of like. For example, I really like watching movies. On the other hand, if you want to play down how much you like something, you can say kind of. For example, I kind of like playing tennis. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. If you don't have any special hobbies or don't want to be specific, a good way to reply is, I like hanging out with my friends and stuff like that. I like hanging out with my friends and stuff like that. Just use I like and add hanging out with my friends and then add and stuff like that. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. This series explains some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn some different ways people will ask you, where are you from? First though, where are you from? can mean many things. It can mean, what city are you from? Or, what state are you from? In fact, Americans ask this question to each other all the time to learn what part of America the other person comes from. Of course, though, it can also mean, what country are you from? If you want to answer this question, there are two ways to do it. You can say, I'm plus your nationality, as in, I'm Japanese, or I'm Brazilian. Or you can say, I'm from, plus the country you are from, as in, I'm from Italy, or I'm from Thailand. If you're from a really famous city or place, you can say that too. For example, I'm from Beijing, or I'm from New Delhi. Many times though, Americans won't ask, what country are you from? Or even, where are you from? In many casual situations, they will say it in a simpler way. Where are you from? This is just like, where are you from? But they take out the are. Where are you from? You can use this too in casual situations. Of course, in the United States, as in other parts of the world, people may be a little more indirect because they want to be polite. To do this, they might ask you if you are from the place where they meet you. For example, if you meet someone in New York, they might ask, are you from New York? Or if you are in San Diego, they might ask, are you from San Diego? Many parts of the United States are very multicultural, so asking the question this way avoids what could be an embarrassing mistake. You can answer this the same way you answer, where are you from? Just add a simple no in front. For example, you can say no plus I'm plus nationality. No, I'm French. Or no plus I'm from plus country. No, I'm from Russia. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. Since the United States is very large, 
People you meet may take great pride in the place or region they come from. If you ask someone about where they're from, they may respond by saying something like West Coast or the East Coast or California or the South or the Midwest. If they answer in this way, it usually means they are interested in talking more about their region and how it differs from others. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn some ways to get in touch with someone after you have met them once already. In a lot of textbooks, you've probably seen the question, what's your phone number? What's your phone number? It's a very useful question, but there are two problems with it. First, it can sound a little too direct, especially when talking to members of the opposite sex. And second, people use the phone a lot less these days than they used to. Instead, they might prefer to connect by email or on a social network like Facebook. To start, though, a simple variation on what's your phone number that sounds a little less direct is, could I get your number? Could I get your number? We start the sentence with could, which softens the request. Next say I, then get, and finally your number, which is short for your phone number. This question is slightly casual, but it can be used in almost any situation. Recently, Many people prefer to use email rather than the phone to communicate. Asking someone for his or her email address is also a little less direct than asking for their phone number. Could I get your email address? Could I get your email address? We just took could I get your number and replaced number with email address. It's that simple. Could I get your email address? If someone asks you either of these questions, you can reply by saying, Sure, my phone number is... Sure, my phone number is... Or, Sure, my email address is... Sure, my email address is... Or, Sure, it's... And then say your phone number or email address at the end. By the way, if you're having any trouble with numbers, check out EnglishClass101.com's core word lists for these and other key vocabulary words. Each word comes with a picture, audio samples so you can perfect your pronunciation, and sample sentences and phrases so you can master its use in a sentence. Recently, many people use social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn or an online chatting service like Skype to communicate. People might ask you about these, especially if they are younger. If someone wants to connect with you through one of these services, they may simply ask, Are you on? followed by the name of the service. Are you on Facebook? Are you on Facebook? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Skype? Are you on Skype? To answer, you can simply say, Yes, I am. Or, no, I'm not. If you respond with, yes, I am, the other person may ask how they can connect with you on one of these services. Of course, if you're not on one of these services, they won't be able to contact you. If you still would like to stay in touch with the person, though, you can say, no, but my email address is, or, no, but my phone number is, and then say your email address or phone number. By telling the other person a different way they can contact you, you'll show them that you want to hear from them. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to ask someone where they went to school or college. Asking someone where they went to college is a good small talk question and conversation starter. 
However, you have to be careful not to offend people if they didn't go to college. We'll tell you how to do this. The question is simple. If the other person is over 22, it's likely they will have left college already, so you ask using the past tense. Where did you go to college? You could also say, where did you go to school? In American English, depending on context, school often means the same as college. If the other person is British or European, however, they're more likely to say, where did you go to university? The answer to this question is really easy. All you say is, I went to university in city. I went to Southern Oregon University in Ashland. If the name of the city or town is part of the university's name, like Tokyo University or Oxford University, you can add the name of the country instead. I went to Tokyo University in Japan. Once you've heard the other person's answer, it's polite to make some kind of comment. For example, wow, that's a really famous university. Or just, oh, really? Sometimes, when you ask, where did you go to college? The other person might reply, I didn't go to college. In this situation, you should be careful how you reply so as not to appear rude. It's polite to not act surprised, but instead make a positive comment like, oh, really? Or ask a question like, did you go straight into a job? Now it's time for Alicia's advice. A good follow-up question to keep the conversation going is to ask the other person, what did you study? Or what was your major? This gives them an opportunity to talk about something they're interested in. In this video, you'll learn 10 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 2000 most common words and phrases in English. Each lesson will help you practice and review what you've learned. We'll also include the previous lessons at the end, because reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard decks, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is... Infection. 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 An infection is not a good thing to have. So an infection refers to a wound on the body usually that has bacteria or something else bad in it that creates sometimes a very painful experience or it can create something that's very, very unpleasant. So when we have an infection, we need to get medicine to take care of the infection. For example, skin infection, skin infection. Skin infection. Next is flu. 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 The flu refers to a very, very common type of sickness. Flu is short for influenza, a type of sickness. So the flu refers to just a general feeling of not being in very good health for most of us. We can have a fever, maybe we have a runny nose, maybe our stomach hurts, or we have some combination of these feelings. So when we say we have the flu, it generally means we have this very common type of illness that affects the body, usually for a short period of time. This happens a lot in winter. Here's an example expression. Flu season. Flu season. Flu season. Okay, the next word is trumpet. 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 A trumpet is a musical instrument. This is a brass instrument that can be held in the hands. It has three keys at the top, and the person playing the instrument can control the pitch of the sound with their lip motions and with the speed of the breath that they're using through the instrument and so on. So, for example, brass trumpet. Brass trumpet. Brass trumpet. Next is departure gate. Departure gate. Departure gate. The departure gate is a very important thing to know when you are traveling by air. The departure gate is the place in the airport that your flight is going to leave from. So it usually is on your boarding pass, the departure gate number, and you need to go to that specific gate, that specific location, in order to get on your flight. So here's an example. 
Departure gate 43. Departure gate 43. Departure gate 43. Next is sociology. 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 Sociology is the study of humans and the study of human behavior. So when we study sociology, we look at the different ways that humans have relationships, the ways that humans have interacted over time, the ways that we maybe communicate through our body language or through our words. There are many, many different factors to sociology, but they all relate to societies and people. Here's an example expression. Study of sociology. Study of sociology. Study of sociology. Okay, the next word is flight attendant. Flight attendant. Flight attendant. A flight attendant is a person who works on an airline and they're the people that help you when you need something to eat or something to drink or when you have a question while you're on the flight. If you need a blanket or if you need some help with maybe headphones, for example, you talk to a flight attendant. Flight attendant can refer to either a man or a woman. For example, female flight attendant. Female flight attendant. Female flight attendant. The next word is seat. 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 So a seat is a place to sit. So you might have many seats in your house. Any place that you can sit down can be called a seat. Generally, however, when we make a reservation for something, for example, at a concert or maybe on an airplane, we have one specific seat that is for us only. So for example, airplane seat. Airplane seat. Airplane seat. Okay, the next word is medicine. 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 So the word medicine has a couple of different uses. It can refer to the study of human health and how to recover from injuries and illness. And the word medicine can also be used to talk about something that we take or that we put on our bodies to help us to recover from an injury. So doctors and nurses study medicine in order to give their patients medicine to recover from things. Here's an example, field of medicine. Field of medicine. Field of medicine. Okay, the next one is economy class. Economy class. Economy class. Economy class usually refers to a specific type of seat or a specific category of seat on an airplane. You may also find economy class on something like a train, perhaps. So economy class usually refers to the most affordable seats on an airplane or on a train. There are other types of classes that you can buy, but economy is usually the cheapest and tends to be maybe the least comfortable as well. Here's an example expression. Economy class seats. Economy class seats. Economy class seats. Okay, next is flight. 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 All right. Flight refers to a couple different things in English, but in many cases, it refers to traveling through the air. So when you make a reservation for airline travel, we usually say, I reserved a flight, which means you reserved a seat on a plane that's going through the air. So for example, boarding pass for the flight. Boarding pass for the flight. Boarding pass for the flight. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the word for a medical condition when bacteria and other bad things get into an injury or inside your body and cause a reaction? Infection. Infection.
and how to say the medical condition that's very common and can affect your stomach, your nose, and your throat sometimes at the same time. Flu. Flu. What about the musical instrument that you play by blowing into a brass instrument with three buttons on the top? Trumpet. Trumpet. Do you remember how to say the location in the airport where you leave from? The place where you get on your airplane and leave the airport. Departure gate. Departure gate. Let's try the word that refers to the study of human society and people and the way we interact. Sociology. Sociology. What about the word for the person on an airplane who helps the customers on the airplane by bringing food, drinks, and giving other services? Flight attendant. Flight attendant. Now, let's see if you remember how to say the noun for a place where you sit. Seat. Seat. Another one. What about the word that you use to talk about something you take, something you drink or eat, in order to fix a medical condition? Medicine. Medicine. Do you remember how to say the type of ticket that you buy on an airplane that is the most basic kind of seat? Economy class. Economy class. And finally, do you remember how to say the word we use to talk about traveling by airplane, the noun that we use to talk about this type of travel? Flight. Flight. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 10 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time! Bye! When learning a new language, everyone should have an ultimate goal to work towards. Whether you want to be able to connect with a relative, easily order food while traveling, or go somewhere new, having an end goal for your learning can be very motivating. A popular but challenging goal is being able to speak like a native speaker. It's difficult to measure exactly when you reach this goal, and it's not something you can pick up using textbooks alone. So how do you work on making your speech more natural? That's what we're going to look at today. Here are three tips to help you practice talking like a native speaker. Number one, focus on vocabulary. If your goal is to speak like a native, you might be really focused on speaking quickly or using as many complex grammar patterns as possible. But in our native languages, we're not always trying to speak as fast as possible. And we use complex grammar patterns when necessary, not to show off. Vocabulary, however, is extremely important to expressing ourselves naturally. Your choice of words can reveal a lot about you and your understanding of the language. Most learners have had the experience of using a phrasebook or a dictionary to find a word they want to use, trying the word in conversation, and getting a look of confusion from the native speaker. In some cases, although your word choice may be grammatically correct, the word may be inappropriate for the situation or totally unnatural. This is especially important in business and other formal situations, where the right level of formality and professionalism is key. Being able to understand nuances and vocabulary words can also help you understand relationships between people just by listening to the conversation. 
try to listen to many different types of conversations. Listen to how people talk to their friends, their superiors, and in customer service situations. This will give you a better idea of how to talk to others naturally. In some languages, you can omit words from sentences or use more direct communication styles. It's important to be aware of these things so you can apply them yourself. Colloquialisms and slang are also commonly used in most languages. As this sort of vocabulary is always evolving, it can be difficult to keep up with the latest words. Talk with native speakers and consume media in your target language to make sure you pick up these kinds of expressions. Media is a great resource for your learning. Ultimately, knowing the appropriate vocabulary to use for each situation will really help you sound more knowledgeable. Number two, perfect your accent. With every language, there are unique pronunciation and intonation challenges. Some languages are tonal languages, and a change in pitch can completely change the meaning of a word. Then there's the fact that most countries have multiple dialects, and so people from one area of the country may sound different from those in another. So what is the best way to listen to a wide range of accents and different pronunciations? Video and audio resources are a great way to do this. YouTube is a perfect place to start because people from all kinds of different backgrounds upload videos to the platform. You can watch educational videos, daily life vlogs, cooking shows, a travel series, whatever interests you. Pay attention to the different ways people speak. Everyone is unique. And then practice speaking like them. This kind of practice can help you sound more natural. One note, please be aware of the type of resources you're using. For example, if you find a video where a speaker uses a rare dialect, it might not be a good idea to use that for your pronunciation practice, unless you have a special reason for studying a specific accent. As a general rule, it's best to try to search for practice resources that use a standard form of the language you're studying. Number three, copy what you hear. Do you remember how you learned to speak as a child? We rarely learned new words just listening to them or reading after we learned how. When we were little kids, we imitated the sounds we heard by repeating the sounds out loud. While you're talking to a friend, watching videos, or listening to audio in your target language, you can do this to try and replicate the way they speak. Doing this will help you work on mastering the flow of the language, your accent, intonation, and pronunciation. Of course, you might also pick up some new vocabulary this way. Make sure to repeat new words often. It's a great way to make sure you remember them. Try doing this using a number of different mediums and sources. That way, you'll be exposed to the diversity that the language offers and master the fundamentals of pronunciation. For example, you can watch and imitate several different YouTube videos and audio CDs, but try a few different sources, like different creators or different audio types, to make sure you experience a wide range of communication in your target language. If you're using our language learning program, you can even get your own teacher with Premium Plus. Your teacher can answer questions, give assignments, and even listen to your recordings and give you advice on pronunciation. Completing these kinds of lessons with a native teacher can really boost your confidence in your speaking skills. Becoming able to speak like a native is a popular goal for many people learning a new language. It feels great to be able to communicate smoothly, especially when the people you're talking to expect basic level sentences or broken communication. Try using the tips we've shared in this video to work on improving your speaking skills. Of course, it'll take time and persistence, but the reward will be more natural communication. And for even more tips on speaking, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Expand your vocabulary with our core 2000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone.